Welcome everyone. I'm, I'm Nigel Carrington. I'm the Vice Chancellor of UAL and I'd like to welcome you all to uh, this uh, session in UAL's Graduate Showcase and to say particular thanks to the Creative Industries Federation who are co-hosting this event with us. Uh, now a few weeks ago the Federation released a report called A Plan to Reimagine and it was the product of a coalition of businesses of universities and of creative practitioners. Some of you will have read it, uh, some of you will actually have been part of its creation, but some of you may only just have picked it up via the link in our invitation. So before I introduce our panelists, I just want to say a few words about why it's important and why we're here today. We're here because there is a crisis in the creative sector. It's a crisis brought on partly by the pandemic, and its consequences. But more importantly, we're here because the creative sector can help the country emerge stronger from the crisis. And a plan to reimagine kicks off the conversation about how we can most effectively work with others to make this happen. Our sector is certainly resilience and it's resilient, resilience like its value comes from its relative diversity and the ability of both its large and its small businesses to reimagine the future. And perhaps most of all, it comes from its ability to engage and inspire people. We all know, of course, that the creative industries have been creating new jobs faster than other sectors of the economy for more than a decade. They were instrumental in driving the UK out of the 2008 recession. And in many ways, of course, they've invented the world we now live in and to some extent have relied on during the pandemic from Netflix to Zoom. Our creative universities are also global leaders with three of uh, the UK's universities in the top 10 rankings for art and design. But the pandemic has hit us all very hard. It's been difficult for many creatives to maintain a stable living. Many creative jobs are insecure. Some of our organisations are among those most at risk from a second lockdown. And it's clear that we now need a sustained long-term plan. The recent government £1.5 billion uh, support package has been hugely welcomed, but it's no, by no means a fix for the creative economy. Oxford Economics, as many of you will know, has projected the financial, financial impact of the pandemic on the sector at over 400,000 creative job losses and over 70 billion lost in revenue. And this is what the Fed's plan to reimagine deals with. It outlines 12 big ideas and it identifies three core drivers leading to one main goal, which is, quote, to build a better future for everyone. The core drivers, as, you, as, you'll have, as you'll have seen, are people, because everyone from every community has the right to be creative in their jobs and their skills, to shape their future and follow their entrepreneurial dreams. A core driver is clearly ideas. They need to be encouraged by research and connected with society's needs. And the third is money, which is best spent when it's invested in people and ideas. And an investment in creativity may be as much to do with the quality of life as with the economic bottom line. This is something that's so often neglected in, in, in our um, current dialogue with government. So today, with the help of our panellists, I'm going to introduce them one by one as I ask them to speak, we'll explore how the creative sector can achieve this and support the national recovery. Some of the themes we're going to touch on include how we make the case to government, how we make the case to the wider public for the importance of creativity when so many people are struggling with their basic livelihoods and with the prospect of further lockdown. We're going to think about the changes that may be needed within the industry to improve the resilience of our businesses that operate within it. How are we going to address some of the burning issues around inequality and precarious jobs? And how can creativity help power the UK's research and development revolution as the government seeks to invest more in our intellectual skills over the coming decade? Our goal today is to 
leave this session acknowledging that in the words of the plan to reimagine change is possible and if we use this moment of awakening to apply our country's creativity to our future success we can ensure that 2020 is an important moment in history that we can look back on with pride so i look forward very much to the uh, to this conversation and i'd now like to introduce and pose some questions to each of our panelists before uh, we move on to, uh, to to your questions the audience questions to the panelists um, i'd also just note that neil mendoza who's the recently appointed dcms commissioner for cultural renewal has very kindly agreed to join us and i'm going to ask him at the end to say to make some concluding remarks having listened to the conversation um, but first, let me introduce uh, Sir Peter Bazalgette. Peter, as you know, is the executive chairman of ITV, but uh, we owe him lots of debts in the sector. He was a very uh, energetic and successful chairman of the Arts Council. And in 2017, Peter led the review of the creative industries for the government, which led to the sector deal. Uh, Peter is also a non-executive director of UK Research and Investment. So, he's very much in a position to listen to the conversation today and help it to shape his feedback to uh, to government so peter perhaps just initially i could um i could talk to you about the theme of making the case to, to government how how best can we make that case that the creative industries need the support that's outlined in the plan thank you very much nigel um thanks for your introduction and thanks to the organizers of this event and for inviting me to take part in a, a very important conversation. Uh, and may I just say I'm delighted we've got Neil Mendoza joining us uh, uh, to say a few words at the end. I think he's going to be a very powerful voice for the creative industries in the House of Lords going forward. Now, um, you've asked me to talk about making the case to government. So really, I'm going to be talking about what I think the most effective arguments are in the current political context. And I'm going to sort of put it under three headings, uh, what the political context specifically is, uh, secondly, what the main themes of a forward strategic view, as you say, Nigel, a long-term view would be, and thirdly, what some important elements of that will be. All of those, uh, I'm really highlighting different ideas that are in the Creative Industries Federation report. So I know all of us probably on this call get it. We get the importance of the creative industries, we get what their value was up to COVID. We understand how fast they were growing and how much they contribute, not just to the economy, but also to the culture and the international reputation of the, um, of the country. So um, it, it, it's also important, I think, to say that uh, we've grown up as a sector. Uh, we were only defined 20 years ago. We've now got the Creative Industries Council, Creative Industries Federation, and the document attached to this event is as an example of the fact we now have the capacity to suggest and create policy, which is a, is a great step forward to where we were five or ten years ago. So the political context first. Um, we know DCMS is going to champion the sector, and it does do so, and we've discovered that when it won that 1.5 million of emergency funding for arts and culture. But um, we are dealing with the most presidential government in our lifetimes. It used to be just number 11 and number 10 that matters, but now I suggest it's just number 10. And there, there's um, a lot of policies driven by Dominic Cummings, who admirably, in a way, wants to invest a lot more in science. But we want to make sure the creative industries don't get overlooked in that. And the, there's another ally there, the head of the policy unit, Manura Mirza, who certainly does uh, understand the creative industries and has great ambitions for design. So we must take that opportunity of those who understand what the language we're talking who are in number 10 and i would suggest it's number 10 that matters and this is a very timely conversation because it's towards the end of september that dcms's bid will go in to a four-year comprehensive spending review this is a government with a majority of 80 they're going to be in power for the next four years and th th this csr is the most important one for some time so the way that pitch is made, refined in the next six to eight weeks, and then made at the end of September, very, very important. Um, 
I'm confident, by the way, from my conversations with DCMS, that they will absolutely, Nigel, address the point you made, which is that it's absolutely right to talk about emergency crisis funding for problems we have here and now. But it would be terrible if you went pitched into a CSR without a long-term strategic view from the sector and without a response in that way from the government. So that's critical and I'm going to now address perhaps what that long-term strategic view might be about. And for me, there are two themes that chime with what the government says it's trying to do. The first is levelling up, which I would describe as both geographical but also cultural. If we are the heartbeat of the nation, if we are the national conversation, we all know we've got to do better on diversity, but we also have to make sure that the bulk of the value created isn't, doesn't reside in London and the South East. So levelling up is part of this government's agenda. We've got to come up with the ideas that match that. I believe we can. Secondly, I'd say a main theme would be um, research and technological excellence. Um, my own experience from the creative clusters we've been working on, invested in by the UKRI via the sector deal, where 300 SMEs have been connected to research excellence in universities. My own experience there tells me we can do really good things locally, connecting excellence in higher education to um, forward thinking LEPs, uh, local authorities who want to develop business in their area, uh, the talent base of small companies, however much they may be hurting right now. So those will be my two main themes, levelling up and research and technological excellence. And then finally, because we've only been afforded five or six minutes and Nigel will probably cut me off, cut me off without a, without a second thought if I go over my time, I just wanted to suggest a few elements that could sit Again, I'm talking politically here, I'm talking about what I think is part, matches the government's uh, uh, agenda. Uh, some elements that sit below those main themes. And one would be that the creative industries is a cross-cutting interdisciplinary asset. That what we do helps all the other sectors. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about, say, um, virtual reality uh, developments that can be used in Rolls-Royce training and production, or whether you're talking about uh, championing of design, which is critical to all things digital, but all things physical as well, or whether you're talking advertising and marketing, which positions products sold here and abroad in, in the right light with the right branding. These are all thing assets for the whole of British industry. A second is the importance of the knowledge economy. We now know that only, what, 9-10% of the British economy is actually manufacturing. You wouldn't know it listening often to government ministers and civil servants who like standing in car parks and saying we created 3,000 jobs in the car industry today. But actually, what the British economy is going to be about in the future is the knowledge economy, the IP economy. And that's exactly what the creative industries is. And that's a very important um, element. Soft power. In the post-Brexit era, whatever your views on Brexit, it's happening. We need to make trade deals around the world like we never did before. We need to be more open to the world than we ever have been before. And the products of the creative industries, which are not only traded internationally in the English language, which is a massive asset, they go before us. And where our soft power um, creative industry products are enjoyed, other trade follows. So soft power is a critical element of what we have to offer and it absolutely matches the government's agenda in terms of doing new trade deals. And finally, I just wanted to say, it's, it, it's easy, particularly in the arts and cultural sector, to make it sound as though one's put, simply putting out a begging bowl. There's nothing wrong with putting out a begging bowl. Having chaired the Arts Council, I, I absolutely know how, how good and effective public funding can be. But in the context of the creative industries, it's not a begging bowl, it's a partnership. We, we proved with the creative clusters that where 90 million went in from UKRI, 60 million came from matching from industry. And this, what we must be proposing in the CSR this autumn is a partnership with government, not a sort of, shall I say, self-entitled whinge for money. It has to be, uh, it's going to deliver stuff and we're going to step up as well. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, lots of questions, I'm sure, will come out of that. Um, please do put your questions in the Q&A as soon as you have them, and I will pick them up uh, once all of our panellists have spoken. 
So our second uh, panelist is Chino Adimba. Chino is a playwright and poet, uh, but she started her career working for the BBC and ind independent TV production companies before founding an arts marketing audience development consultancy. Um, now a playwright, she's also active um, in, in theatre. She's a member of the Board of Trustees at Bristol Old Vic. And I'd like to ask Chino to talk a little bit about making the case to the public at a time when so many people are struggling in so many aspects of their life. Why should they care about the arts and creativity? I don't just mean make the case to the public that goes to the theatre, but makes the case to the public as a whole. Um, and of course, um, we've, we've got to counter the narrative that the arts and creativity are expendable for an elite. I wonder, I, 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 I wonder if uh, Chino, you would uh, be, we would just address some of those themes. Hello, um, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this discussion. Um, it's always hard to follow Peter, <laughs> but I'll try and do my best. Um, I think that for me, the, and I'm going to, just because Peter's done such a good job of laying down some of the I suppose some of the statistics and some of the numbers in terms of what wh why we're here um i'm going to talk about um the humanness of all of this because in a way this is the only way we can make a case for for the arts or the creative sector to the public and i think that humanness is something that is key to a lot of the work i feel now needs to be done um, and, and I'm going to break it down into three kind of key areas, um, to try and hopefully get across. So none of this will be about statistics or data or, or money. And, and, and this is very, very intentional. <laughs> um, I partly because I spend a lot of my time talking about those things. So it's quite nice to prepare something that isn't about those things. So let's talk about the humanness and the humanness that effectively underpins both what we've seen um, in the idea of how a sector comes back from this, but also the humanness that lies at the heart of what we do. And um, it feels really important at this stage to say, um, when I came into the arts, I came into the arts as an older black woman <laughs> and I came into the arts as a single parent. And so my perspective on how you enter the arts, I think, has left me with some very clear needs from the things that I want to see. And I suppose the first place to start for me is that this moment does offer a very unique potential for us as a sector, for us to change our own story. And you mentioned there, Nigel, about us, us changing the story of being an expendable elite type of thing. And I think that's absolutely true. But in order to change that narrative, we need to look at how we have created a them and us, and the who's the us and who's the them in that equation, I think is a really big question because for, for a public to feel empowered in the creative industries and, and sector, I think they have to feel that they are the majority in the situation and, that, and, and, and that's where the impetus for what we, what we output, the decisions we make and the way we I suppose the way the messages we send out about the sector, where that lies. So the them and us leads to the connectivity. More so than ever, we've realised that as human beings, we need that connectivity. Um, and in needing that connectivity, we started to search for the connectivity in our relationship with the creative sector. So one of the things I suppose that came up for me in reading the document was the idea that the pandemic has generated a need and a desire for more sustainable living and life work balance. 
and creativity has helped to do that. And I start to go, where else can creativity help us to connect more? And that feels like a question that is deep at the heart of what it means to be both human and what it means to be, to say you work in the creative sector. Um, Peter touched upon the, the diversity and inclusivity conversation. And I think that this connects to the first point. Does our creative sector look like our country? Does our creative sector look like the public? How can we sell something to a public when we don't look like them? When we don't look like what's happening in the streets of our country? And this kind of leads me to my second big point about regionality. It's not just how we look, it's also how we sound. I am a North Londoner who has been a Bristolian on and off for 22 years. I work across the country, yet the majority of the work I do, the majority of these conversations happen in one particular part of the country. How do we sell a creative sector that again seems to only even geographically live in one place? Is that about celebrating the work that is going on around the country more? And is that about changing the voices that speak for the sector? Which leads me on to the third point. When we're talking about the sector looking like the public, sounding like the public, then I guess the next question becomes about what our leadership within the creative sector looks like. And so we start to see a connectivity between how we sound, how we look, but also who, who is having those conversations in the first place. So for me, that word diversity inclusivity needs to feel broader in so many ways, but also needs to start being led from the top. And if we are going to stick with, and I don't have the robust um, arguments against what feels like a trickle down system that we work with at the moment, I don't have a ro robust enough um, counter argument for that but if we are going to stick with that system then how do we make sure that from top to bottom that trickle down is absolutely hitting everyone um, and I guess my final point hopefully I haven't gone over my time um, I guess my final point is about the idea that the case to the public must be seen. And this is slightly more controversial. We have done a lot of talking over the last few months. We have done a lot of talking over the last few years. And I would say we've done a lot of talking over the last few decades. And I think more than ever, the only way we can make that case now is by action. And I feel action needs to become a language that we get familiar with. And, and action may feel, compared to a lot of the talking and a lot of the infrastructures that have been set up to enable that talking, the action may feel quite radical, but action is very much what is needed. I've done 18 years in the creative industries and um, I have no intention of giving up anytime soon. But I think that there is now a question at looking at the word reset does feel important. But I think we, 
we might be looking at changing so many of our other language around this. We need to speak a different language and we need to speak one that reflects the world around us. I think my time is up, Nigel. Please tell me if it's not. <laughs> That's fantastic, Gino. Thank you so much. We'll come back to some of those themes later. Um, our, th our third panellist is um, <clears throat> David Bickle, who's a partner at Hawkins Brown Architects, but also an academic. He, he teaches and is an external examiner at a number of universities, including UAL. And, and unusually, I think um, he took some time out from being a practicing architect in 2015 to become a, uh, the director of design exhibitions and future plan at the VNA. Uh, he rejoined Hawkins Brown in 2018. And David, I know, has a particular interest in how we deal with some of these structural inequalities uh, within the sector. Obviously, Chino has really highlighted some of those challenges. But uh, David, would you like just to talk a bit more about how as a sector we should go about addressing some of the long-standing issues around equality and, and diversity and ensuring that we are more accessible to everyone, to the public that, uh, that Chino's talked so eloquently about? Uh, thank you, Nigel. Um, thank you, Peter, and especially thank you, Chino. Um, I'm not entirely sure um, how I'm going to follow that. Um, many of the themes that uh, Chino spoke about, I I'm going to talk about too. Um, but it was it was very moving um, and uh, very poignant and very necessary what what Chino was saying. So much of what I'm going to say is probably uh, just going to to add to that. Um, Nigel, I'm just going to use the first few paragraphs of the plan to reimagine, to structure my thoughts, just for the benefit of those who um, have just di dipped into that um, document. It's true that the COVID pandemic is first and foremost a health crisis, but it has increasingly morphed into an ec economic one that could out long outlive the virus while simultaneously spearheading a social revolution. This has been brought into very sharp focus by the brutal and unlawful killing of uh, George Floyd, along with the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on those from a BAME backgrounds, and of course the pressing need to address climate change. We accept the urgent need for wholesale transformation and the need to address structural inequalities and bias. We can now see that change is possible and that we do need to act, as Chino said, and if we are to use this moment of reawakening to apply our country's creativity to our future success, we can ensure that 2020 is a moment in history that we can look back on with pride. Creativity is vital to all of us as citizens, as communities and as a country. It's the very thing that has been bringing people together from the painted rainbows in every window supporting the NHS, chalked pavements and craft projects leading to homeschooling schedules, to the creative tech companies helping us to TikTok, Teams and Zoom our way through this. Digital technology and creative talent have helped us all during this crisis, whilst also providing, I would say, a small clue of what a successful, sustainable 21st century economy might look like. But as Chino says, that future needs to look like us in all its incredible diversity. As we head into the up upcoming employment crises with young people and those from the lowest socioeconomic backgrounds likely to be the worst affected, we need to establish new ways of generating opportunities for the full diversity of individuals whose talent will lead us to economic success and social prosperity. Because our creative industries already shape how the rest of the world see, sees us, we owe it to ourselves to let them see us as we really are, inclusive, innovative and inspiring. However, we do have a long way to go, but we need to get there quickly we need to act with agency, urgency, and with care. We need to recognize and work hard to create a fairer community of creatives that looks out for each other and our communities and works collaboratively. We need to call out unjust, unjust and unfair behaviors and to be actively anti-racist. We need to create opportunities for those who would find it difficult to access a career in the creative industries, either physically, culturally, through access to funds or through other forms of prejudice, discrimination or bias. 
Apprenticeships and other low barriers to entry training initiatives means that more young people can see that a career in the creative industries is viable, earn while you learn. Perhaps more universities and colleges should set, should set up creative business incubators, equipping graduating talent with a necessary entrepreneurial nous, offering business coaching, seed funding, investment and access to opportunities. So bringing money to people with ideas. But above all, we need to better reflect the world in which we live and to create a community that is fair and kind to one another. I'm convinced that intelligent and creative thinking will get us out of this, helping us to create an equitable and just society. We just need to persuade those that in power that this is what matters now. Not helped by the demise of creative subjects within the school curriculum, nor indeed the fact that free travel to the under 18s has been axed, making it difficult for those on low incomes to access education and cultural initiatives. We should also put an end to unpaid internships that exploit young talent. They should be paid too. The time has come for us all to take a position and for it to matter and be meaningful. For being creative reminds us what it means to be human. David Bowie was right in 1977 when he said that tomorrow comes to those that hear it coming. But perhaps we haven't been paying attention and haven't been listening hard enough. That concludes. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Lots of challenges there for, uh, for our conversation with, with our audience. Um, our final speaker um, is Eliza Easton, uh, head of the policy unit uh, at uh, at the uh, Nesta Creative Industries Policy and Exchange Centre. Uh, Eliza was also actually one of the founding members of the Creative Industries Federation staff team. We know Eliza very well. She's a fantastic authority on some of these policy questions. So I'd like to ask you, Eliza, um, what research tells us about how policymakers should approach the future of the sector? Yeah, thanks. And it's been great to listen to the panel so far and really interesting questions that I hope we can get stuck into um, if I'm quick enough. Um, I suppose my job at both Nesta and at the Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Centre, or we just call it the PEC, is to think about what independent academic evidence tells us about the future of policy and what that should look like. And the reality is that, like in so many other areas, Whilst if you studied economics, economics at school, you would have thought about manufacturing. Um, the first time I actually did an economics course, we got to the page on the arts and creative industries and they said, yeah, you're not going to need to know this. Um, so I think part of the purpose of the centre is just to think about the fundamental evidence that's needed um, to ensure the policymakers can, can do their job. And since the COVID-19 pandemic, there's been kind of three areas that we've been particularly thinking about. Um, alongside some of the some of the subjects that have come up earlier today and I particularly wanted to quickly mention a piece of research that went live this morning um, which looked at all sorts of things to do with content consumption during lockdown but actually showed a really exacerbated class divide um, over lockdown and would be something I'd be happy to talk about more in the panel discussion um, but I'd first like to talk about research and development and innovation which has come up quite a bit um, over the last kind of three interventions. And um, I personally believe that um, in order to rebuild the sector, we have to encourage more research and development, both through kind of specific projects, and um, Peter spoke a little bit about some that have happened in the past, um, and in areas like artificial intelligence, where we know there's real scope for change, but also um, using a broader definition of research and development in itself. And investment in innovation is kind of commonly understood as a really good way to boost productivity, which is what the government um, claims to, to want to do above almost all else. And actually, which parties of every colour um, political parties have agreed on. Um, but I think that policymakers continue to get it wrong when it comes to the way that they focus the incentives that they introduce to try and get businesses to do um, more research and development. And that's because we use a definition of R&D that doesn't play to any of the national strengths that we've been spoken about, that we've spoken about and leaves out arts, um, humanities and social sciences. And so much of the R&D that happens in the creative industries, which 
is based on developing content and experiences and isn't just about building new widgets. It's completely left out from the government's plans um, for improving um, research and development. And because of this, creative businesses aren't included in, say, tax incentives that the government provides to encourage businesses to do more R&D. And so when we're thinking about ways in which we can encourage um, growth in the creative industries that other sectors have opened to them and isn't just seen as a kind of handout, this to me is a completely clear way. In fact, Nestor did a piece of research which showed that using a slightly different definition of R&D, creative businesses do as much research and development as manufacturing. And we believe they could do even more boosting the UK's productivity and actually inspiring us with new experiences and new content. And it's a time when the creative industries are suffering and um, the government is saying they're attempting to kind of curb that free fall in many parts of the sector. It again seems completely illogical that we're not focusing um, investments as we describe them when it comes to R&D. Um, we're instead talking about handouts. Um, it's also worth saying that the Conservative Party manifesto, actually following our recommendation to review the definition, did say they were going to, um, but since then it's all gone really quiet. So um, we'll have to see kind of what happens there. Um, and actually we've done another piece talking about the kind of specific interventions, looking at artificial intelligence and the creative industries. Um, and I've noticed over the past few years that most creative industries programs, projects, investments that have been funded talk about artificial intelligence, but almost never do the billion pounds spent on artificial intelligence talk about the huge opportunities in the creative industries. And again, I think we've come so far in understanding what this part of the economy might mean, but we still fundamentally don't really see how it fits in with um, how, how policymakers often see the economy, which is as if it's still the 1980s. So another way that evidence points us to kind of reimagine the world, which um, Peter spoke about at the beginning and has been mentioned right through, is um, thinking about uh, what it means to have genuinely a kind of UK-wide investment programme. And so one of the pieces of work we did almost immediately when the crisis hit was to look at the last financial crisis and see what happened there in 2008. And what we noticed was that actually there was really strong growth in creative industries all around the country, especially in kind of smaller urban centres um, outside London, outside the southeast, right across the UK. And then the recession happens and everything concentrated back in on London and all of that growth was lost. And we're pushing hard to say that should really warn us against repeating the same mistakes again. It's been um, really fascinating over the last few weeks. I've been talking almost weekly to kind of governments in other countries as well. And um, they're having exactly the same problem, which is in recessions like this, everything focuses back on the capital. But the UK has it worst of all just because of the way that London um, corresponds with the rest of the country. And so there's never been a better time to think about how we can actually protect everything that has been built outside of London. We don't want it concentrating back on the capital for a whole load of reasons. And in terms of really specific opportunities for investment, actually we found that any kind of, kind of cluster, any kind of city centre, even rural areas can grow the creative industries. Nothing's off limit in terms of what can actually be achieved. And as we're all working from home, we can see the opportunities more than ever of being in, you know, I spoke to someone earlier today, I had no idea they were in Cornwall, until the end of the meeting. And the only reason I really realized was because we were talking about how good their Wi-Fi connection was, which it definitely isn't where I am in Hackney. Um, so there are just such evidently um, kind of significant opportunities in terms of genuinely rethinking how we invest in the creative industries and support them outside. And we've got a crisis now, but if we can hold those areas through it, we're gonna see really good growth. Finally, I'd just like to talk briefly because it hasn't come up about the future of higher education and, and many people on the call probably know that um, creative subjects at higher education are uh, significantly under threat. We've been talking for ages about how in England the EBAC has been um, leading to fewer people doing um, the arts at school, but now we're seeing uh, the government commissioned Orga review um, talk about value for money in terms of subjects and specifically worrying practitioners, recipients and beneficiaries of creative education about um, the future of those subjects. And now even more recently, we heard about university bailouts potentially being contingent on the dropping of low value subjects. 
And so again, we kind of, in the policy and evidence center, tried to step into gear to understand actually what's going on. And, and actually it kind of goes back to something that the last two people um, have been talking about, which is, and across the whole panel really, which is like, what, what, what do we want from jobs? What do we want from careers? When government talks about good work, what do they actually mean? Because yes, it is certainly true that some creative jobs are underpaid in terms of the actual value that they add to society. And that's something which I think the industry has to face. But in terms of supporting the UK's economy, they're undoubtedly important and getting more so as we see the sector as the future. Um, and also they offer genuine jobs in what people want to do. So when we look at questions of life satisfaction, for example, people who are able to make use of their degrees in creative careers might not earn as much as, as a load of bankers. But if the case was that people doing arts degrees went and worked in the financial sector, I think we'd have other questions about the, about the um, importance of those degrees and the skills they teach. So I wanted to kind of leave that as, as three areas where evidence is kind of shifting and changing how we think about it um, and um, hand back for some time with the panel. Thank you very much, Eliza. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. That's an incredibly stimulating set of reflections. Uh, I noticed that actually the questions being posed in the in the Q&A are largely being answered, but I'm going to try and um, I'm going to try and take a bigger theme. Please keep answering um, in the chat panelists, but I'm going to try and take a bigger theme, which tries to tie some of these questions together, because I think um, Peter's really posed the real issue in a very succinct answer to uh, to JQ and Q8. Um, and it's probably one of our big dilemmas as a, as a sector. We all believe, I think we all believe passionately in the innate power for, for humanness, as Chino called it, of, of creativity. But somehow when we talk, as um, Peter did, about the fact that we need a partnership with government in relation to the comprehensive spending review, we always bump up against the horrible issue of money and how we make the link. And I think coming out of some of these conversations are some really important messages around what, what creativity can do across the whole country, across um, the things that make us feel human as well as the things that generate cash. But I wondered that maybe I could ask each of the panelists very quickly just to summarize what their key message would be to to the creative industries and the creative sector as a whole, culture, theatre, etc. as we start to, not start to, as we hopefully finalise the sort of pitches we will make to government in relation to the Comprehensive Spending Review, how do we, what do we propose as the key elements of a partnership with government in relation to the CSR? How do we better uh, convey the message that we can make a huge contribution across the economy as well as across culture, not just through the growth of the creative industries, but through applying creativity in almost everything that every industry does. How do we, at the same time, as we start to talk about money, um, pick up the challenge that Chino has given us around um, the them and the us? Um, how do we make the public feel empowered that they are the majority they are working with us but actually uh, embracing our cause because they believe that it's important both for our humanness and for money and i think perhaps that would be quite an interesting quick theme for the panelists before we um answer the answer the specific questions on the chat but also um invite uh neil mendoza to make some concluding comments because um this is about reflecting on our wonderfulness as creatives, but it's also about reflecting on how we communicate urgently with government to seize this moment to make creativity even more important in the future. So perhaps I'll take you panelists in the order in which you spoke. Um, Peter, would you like to just say a few words about that? You're very close yes, to the CSR and-, and well, um, we, are, we have entered the worst recession of our lifetimes. We pray God it isn't as bad as it appears it might, it appears it might be. Consequently, um, partnership with government has got to be defined in terms of economic benefit. Jobs, growth, 
exports and all the rest of it, which by the way is an argument we can make. But when we make that argument, we must never ever forget that we have what I call, as you saw in the answer I gave in text, a USP, which is we are the sector that enriches our democracy and our culture as well. So that is the additional dividend you get from a healthy, growing, creative sector. It's about our national culture and our shared values. And in the internet age, I think our shared values are more critical uh, than ever before. Um, and I'm going to let the others talk uh, more eloquently than I can about what both Chino and David very eloquently set out. But I'll just say one thing. I would like to see some very specific ideas. We, know, we understand what, what the um, philosophy is of a more diverse sector. I'd like to see some very specific ideas. I mean, I'll give you one example, Nigel. I love the Saturday clubs that the Sorrell Foundation and the Arts Council co-fund, and we only have about, I don't know, 50 of them or something, where people in their teens, often in schools in deprived areas where the curriculum is letting them down, as David said him, uh, earlier, can go on Saturdays, develop their creative design flair, meet professionals in the field and begin to work up a network. That's a specific idea. You could have not 100, but 500 of those. So as we talk philosophy, let's start talking about specific ideas and get the government behind them. Thank you, Chino. Well, firstly, as luck will have it, I now have workmen outside the window. So if I <laughs> you can't hear me. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, the, the discussions were very, very interesting. And I think I'm, my opening gambit is I don't think humanness and economics are mutually, you know, exclusive. I think, they, I think they're speaking to each other and I think they could be speaking the same language. And, the, and, and I certainly think that we can see examples of that. And this has always been the frustration, I think, for many of us who have been talking about um diversity and inclusivity in the sector is that we can see very clearly the business money argument for it and actually lots of lots of organizations and lots of the creative industries have been putting themselves at a disadvantage by not engaging fully with the ideas of and the potential of diversity and inclusivity so i don't think the two should ever be spoken about separately i think that i think they're in the same conversation i suppose is the first thing and and we've got businesses like netflix to to show us how that happens you know um and then i really to speak to peter's other point about what what we offer and for me what the creative sector fully offers is that we tell the stories of our lives you know in one way or another whether that's gaming or um or tv programs there is the, the potential for us to be people that are constantly telling the stories of our lives of our times of our history is the thing that is both exciting and at times frustrating <laughs> in in our approach and so um, the idea that we moving ahead and, and how we speak to government about this, I think it's fundamental to understand that for many people, what we're talking about is their first, is their first interaction with the world <laughs> around them. That's, that's the fundamental thing. So no, I might not have gone to the theater, but I was reading books, you know? I was watching, I was watching films and I was learning something and everything about the world in, through those things. And, 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 you know, those memories of the first time a poet comes into your school, <laughs> or the first time you see someone filming something on your street. You know, these are, 
So I think there's something about um, something in this in this discussion about really understanding where where people's first contact with their world lives, and it does live in this sector. It does live it, with the storytellers that make up this sector, and it does live with the visionaries and the innovation that happens within this sector. And I think that we can never lose. Thank you very much, Chilo. Uh, David. Ni yeah, I would like to respond, Nigel, by um, actually in, in my part of the creative industry, and it's terrible that we're kind of seeing it from each of our individual perspectives rather than kind of seeing us as having a collective challenge. But more and more as, as architects, we're being asked to um, determine what our social value is uh, and how that can be um, actually measured. Um, so publicly procured projects often asked us to set out what that might be. Um, and this is really interesting. And, uh, and as, a, as, pra as a practice and as, as Hawkins Brown, we're, we are um, um, positively challenged by that because it's kind of, it's the, the, the sort of life force which kind of creates our projects. And partly it's out of um, sort of post-occupancy evaluation, which is just going back after you've completed a project and understanding um, how well it's done or not and understanding how you, one might do something better next time. But um, uh, determining the social value goes a lot, lot deeper uh, and understands the kind of economic impact that it, a, a project might have in its locale, uh, how many pe local people it employs, what are the learning opportunities around a project uh, or a, a regeneration project or a building, uh, how many young people can kind of interact with it, a whole host of kind of KPIs. So more and more as, as architects, both as, as practitioners and within our own practice and measuring our own social value and what we do um, uh, and how we work with communities, but also the impact of the, the projects that we do is being more and more measured. And perhaps if the, the, the creative um, industries saw that more in terms of try to quantify what that positive social impact was and put some money to it, then we would all have a kind of position of strength to be able to say, it matters because and so we're talking the same language as the policymakers and uh, the politicians. Um, the second point I would like to make is about kind of um, uh, addressing our sort of uh, our bias and our practices and, and, and learning and, and being going on a journey um, and being inspired by things that um, uh, happen around the world and, and that kind of uh, begins to alter and adapt and change the way in which uh, we practice as being creative people. Um, and and I'd, I'd like to kind of draw attention to um, Theaster Gates, uh, mainly because he kind of speaks to me as, as a kind of an architect designer, as a, as a planner in Chicago, he was kind of, uh, and then as a fine artist, working at grassroots level, developing a foundation that works with local people, giving them skills, um, giving them the opportunities, the, the fishing net in which to kind of then uh, embark on a, on a creative world. And I think that we, we have to be constantly alive to um, re-attuning and re-kind of thinking the way in which we engage with the world. And um, in order that young people can be inspired by what we do so that they can feel uh, that they can participate in it in the same way that that Gino said. So I think there's two things there. It's kind of like evolve, 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 evolve. And the other one kind of really get to grips with the, um, the metrics and understand what value we all bring uh, to society that can be measured. Thank you very much, David. Eliza. Yeah, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quick. Um, just to say it's a sort of slightly nerdy point, but I think it's an important one, which is that the the Treasury Green Book, which is how we understand and sign off on the impact of government policy, um, is actually changing quite a lot behind the scenes. And I think it's part of something bigger, which is actually that the government is looking to understand things just beyond the kind of pound sign. What's the environmental impact of different policies? What's the well-being impact? And I think we should be the sector 
using the experience of you know people on this call talking about how they balance it in their day-to-day -day lives we should be the sector that's right there saying we can help you to understand uh impact of policy in a more complex way than just you know how many jobs and how much money we can think about what good work looks like we can think about what well-being looks like we can help you think about environmental impact um, so that's my thought thank you very much um, we're a little bit short of time but i don't want to cut um Neil Short. Um, so I'm, I'm sure people will be very happy to stay for a little bit longer. Uh, Neil, I'd like very much now to introduce you. Neil's the Master of Oriel College, Oxford, um, and as I said before, was recently appointed as the DCMS Commissioner for Cultural Renewal. Um, he really does have an important role now in, in working with government and the sector as we emerge from the impact of the pandemic. And it would be really interesting, Neil, just to hear a few reflections from you based on this conversation. Okay, thanks Nigel. Thanks very much for inviting me along, thanks to UAL. It's been a, a fascinating hour actually. We've, co we've covered so much, you asked me to sum it up, but it's gonna be pretty tricky to, uh, to sum it up. We started with, and I'm gonna do it in one 30 seconds. We started with uh, um, Baz's look at political themes, thinking about the CSR, thinking about the big um, um, sections that occupy government, like levelling up, research and tech excellence, soft power, and the fact that you're going to have this government around for four years. We thought about other themes like how digital tech and content have sustained us. We thought about our research and innovation, R&D tax credits, artificial intelligence, higher education. Um, Eliza, I'm on the Green Book stuff, and we are looking at um, cultural capital as something to seriously consider. But then Chino and David really considered much more about what um, Trino called humanness, thinking about how to engage with the world, considering access for everybody. How can creativity help on connectivity, diversity, regionality, inclusivity, and the fact that the case to the public must be seen. And um, it's rather salutary after a lot of chat that um, Chino exhorted us to think about action and effectively activism rather than, rather than um, only words. But to echo what Peter said, this is, such an incredibly serious um, moment. And um, not just obviously for this, the creative and cultural sectors, but for everybody. And I really want to go back to Nigel's theme and, and, what, and a theme that most people have actually, or everybody has dealt with, which is the desire for the sector to help. And the sector can really help in so many different ways. And without question, this is the moment. And it's an odd one for this sector because if you draw a Venn diagram and here's the, and it goes Tories, Brexiteers, cultural and creative sector, very, very little overlap. However, as Peter said, this government is in place for the next four years or so. So I exhort everyone to try and find a way to work with this government because in a way there is some overlap. And for me, the importance of winning that battle over the cultural rescue package was immense. It was a very long argument, and I disagree with Peter that it's a presidential government. We worked not only with Number 10, but very closely with the Treasury. And this first battle, this first argument, has been won because they understand not only financially how important the creative sectors are and cultural sectors, but practically, emotionally, and how the creative sector does provide this ability to create shared values across the, the, um, the United Kingdom. And the fact that that argument has been won means that the creative sector can really help in particular areas um, where you want to help with leveling up, regionality, inclusivity, with soft power. And yes, with Brexit, there's an, there's an enormous amount that the creative sectors can do to help the country as it negotiates something extremely difficult on top of this uh, pandemic. So I would urge you to perhaps not, perhaps find a way, find a way to do that over the next few years. And I think that then the creative and cultural sectors will have a chance to be incredibly successful and meet uh, many of the aims and plans that you have articulated. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Neil. Um, we, are, we have run out of time, but I would like to say a really big thank you to, um, to everyone who's participated in this. First of all, obviously, to our wonderful panellists, thank you for engaging so very enthusiastically, energetically, and, and with great um, articulation on, on these challenges, which are 
to most of the people on this um, session, I'm sure, just about the most important thing in our lives all the time. Um, thank you particularly to Neil for joining us at very short notice. We're really grateful to you for having been here and listened and, and, and summed up in that way. And, um, and, and thank you to the audience. Thank you for your questions. I've got one to answer, which I'm going to finish, finish off when I finish uh, speaking. But thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you for being passionate about creativity. Thank you for being passionate about the creative industries. Thank you for giving us your ideas. And, uh, and we will be taking them very seriously uh, as, the, as the Federation, as, as UAL, as, uh, as participants in this talk, as we work together to try to ensure that the government really understands the importance of our sector and really understands how best to support it. So thank you. Thanks for being here. Goodbye.